Very fortunate to be joined today by Congressman Ro Khanna of California here to talk about Super Tuesday and what is going on for Biden, especially with regard to his um, policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Great to have you, Congressman. Always great to see you. Great to be in studio. Yeah, of course. So I wanted to get your reaction to the uh, 100,000 plus voters in Michigan who uh, voted uncommitted in protest of Biden's unconditional support of Israel. You know, what is your reaction to that vote? Do you think it's significant? And do you think that it is having a positive impact on Biden's policy? It's a wake up call. I mean, uh, 100,000 voters are a lot of voters. It's five times as many as voted uncommitted uh, for President Obama in 2012. Now, that was a caucus, but this is a lot more voters. And here's the issue, 75% of Arab American and Muslim Americans voted uncommitted, and huge percentages, 15% or up, of precincts and towns that had a lot of young voters voted uncommitted. So there's a particular demographic that is upset, and they're upset because of our policy in Gaza, that we have stopped giving UNRWA aid, that 500,000 Palestinians face starvation if we don't increase aid, that we're continuing to transfer weapons to uh, I Israel that they're using uh, to kill uh, innocent civilians. And they want an end to that, and they want a permanent ceasefire with the release uh, of all the hostages. I think there has been a tonal shift in the administration. Mm. And now, you know, President used the word ceasefire with Seth Meyers, the Vice President Harris used the word ceasefire, but there has not yet been a policy shift. They're still talking about six weeks, not uh, a permanent ceasefire. They're still not talking about consequences in terms of stopping the transfer uh, of weapon sales. There needs to be a shift of policy. And so do you think that the, you call the uncommitted vote a wake up call? Um, do you think that that tonal shift is a result of that uncommitted vote, even as the policy remains the same? Yes, I do. I mean, I don't think it's coincidental that President Biden on Monday night before the Tuesday Michigan primary talks about a ceasefire. I don't think it's coincidental that Vice President Harris uses the word ceasefire a couple days before Super Tuesday and uh, on Bloody Sunday, where she's talking to an African-American uh, audience as well as the national audience. So they understand they've got a problem with voters of color. They have a problem with young voters. They have a problem with progressives. They have a, a problem with Muslim and Arab American voters. I think they don't understand yet fully the full pain, mm. the hurt, the loss, the anger in some of these communities, because it's not just about Gaza. It's about who we are as Americans. And people want a policy. They want two states. They they understand they had the same anger and pain on October 7th. I mean, a lot of the progressives I talked to, they uh, condemn unequivocally those attacks. They condemn the rapes, the sexual assault, the current UN report. But they don't think that uh, two wrongs make a right, that just because uh, Hamas had a brutal terrorist attack doesn't mean uh, that we give uh, Netanyahu, an extreme right winger, weapons to, to kill uh, Gazan civilians. So California votes today, uh, as do 15 other states and one territory. Should voters in whatever way is available to them on the ballot in those various states, should they lob their own protest vote, whether it's voting uncommitted or writing in ceasefire or whatever is allowed on their, in their jurisdiction? Well, I voted for President Biden in California because I uh, have a, a vote in California. Uh, and I voted for him because he's better than Donald Trump when it comes to Middle East peace, from my, my perspective. But this contest isn't between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It's not, and I, but my view is that we have to have the president strong. That said, I, the, I mean, it doesn't really make sense, though, that you're saying the uncommitted vote has had a positive impact, but you don't actually support the uncommitted vote. Well, I support their right. I, I said how I would vote. I mean, I, 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 there's nothing more American than using your ballot to change policy. And so I had great admiration for people like uh, Abdullah, mayor of Dearborn, Abdul Saeed, uh, who said, look, we're going to organize, we're going to do this to help shift policy. Uh, I respect that. And I certainly think they should not be blamed in any way uh, if we don't win the election. We need to win back their trust. I uh, signed up to be part of the president's uh, re-election team because of the stakes of this election. And so my uh, role and job has been to try to build support for the president. I'll continue to do that. So is it your view that if there is a large protest vote, that that hurts Joe Biden for the fall? I think that if there is a large protest vote 
uh, it could if we don't win back the, the trust. So I would never lecture someone saying you have to vote Joe Biden. I'll tell you why I'm voting Joe Biden. The reason I'm voting it is for his holistic record. I mean, on infrastructure, on the IRA, on uh, helping bring manufacturing back. And I think he's the best candidate who has a chance to win right now against Donald Trump. That's my view. But I certainly respect people who want to cast this protest vote and say they want to see a shift in policy. So do you see uh, Joe Biden's unconditional support for Israel and the current policy? Do you see that as an electoral liability? I do think his unconditional bear hug of Netanyahu is a uh, huge uh, challenge with the coalition that we need. I mean, uh, the president can support uh, Israel, can condemn October 7th without basically giving Netanyahu a blank check. I mean, we have not uh, helped d done anything to, to vote in the UN. We've basically vetoed the ceasefire resolutions in the UN. We continue to transfer arms. I grilled Secretary Austin about why are we doing it? When would we stop? Uh, we continue uh, to give Netanyahu a, a blank check on goals that are unachievable. I mean, the total elimination of Hamas fighters, 35,000 of them, when they've only killed 6,000. So there has to be standing up to Bibi. By the way, Bibi doesn't want Biden reelected. He he wants Trump reelected, which is what I find so incomprehensible why we give him a, a black check, blank check. So as you know, many people who are supporters of the uncommitted protest vote movement are, you know, the same place that you are in terms of the fall. They're adamant Biden supporters in terms of being better than Donald Trump. They plan to vote for Joe Biden in the fall. And their explanation of the protest vote is the polar opposite of what you're saying. Rather than seeing this as a way to weaken Joe Biden, they see it as a way to push him in a direction that will you know, push him on the policy to put him in a stronger position. How is that analysis incorrect? Well, one, I don't think they're committed to, to President Biden. I think they well, many need of to, them are. I mean, some, my, some are. Uh, yeah, you're yeah. right. There's a, diversity there's a diversity of views, but and, there are plenty who are. Yeah, and the reason I think it's important to know that is because I think if there isn't a shift in policy, we're going to lose some of these folks. I mean, I think they want to see uh, an end to the war. They want to see an end to the bombing. They want to see a re release of the hostages. Uh, but I, like I said, I think that they have. In democracy, there's rarely one clear right answer. I, I, I think you can make a good case why Joe Biden uh, still deserves re-election as Donald Trump. You can make a good case of, for people who are saying uh, that they want to use their vote in the most American way to get a shift in policy. I decided that, and, that I will support President Biden. That's the best way I can help bring progressives on board for the, 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 the re-election while criticizing him very publicly uh, uh, on uh, a Gaza policy. But I respect people who say, no, they'd rather uh, vote for someone else right now and they want to see a change. So uh, polls reveal that 50 percent of Biden voters believe that Israel is engaged in a genocide against Palestinians right now. Another 30 percent say they're not sure. Do you agree with those voters? I would call it indiscriminate bombing. I mean, I don't I let the legal experts afterwards uh, make a determination of what the legal term is. But what I would say is that there has not been sufficient care given to protect women and children and civilian lives, that there have been bombings of refugee camps, there have been bombings of hospitals. Uh, and I've been calling uh, I, for for months, if it was in early October, for those bombings to stop. I came out for a ceasefire in mid-November. But uh, they, there needs to be far more concern for civilian lives. Would you accept, as you know, the ICJ is investigating whether genocide is being perpetrated by Israel right now? They uh, ruled initially that it was plausible and uh, asked Israel to comply with a number of injunctions. Israel doesn't appear to have complied with that, but we'll put that to the side. Would you accept the ICJ's ruling if they say Israel has indeed been engaged in com committing and inciting a genocide? Well, I uh, support them looking into the matter. I was not one of the House colleagues who signed some letter criticizing the ICJ mm -hmm. for investigating, and I would read their report. I mean, I, I can't you said you'd leave it to the legal experts. I mean, they are well, the legal but, experts. But, but I think our, we also have legal experts at our State Department who need to also do uh, an independent uh, investigation. So right. I would look at all I would of question the, that our State Department is independent, given yeah. the close allyship and relationship, the amount of money that we send every year, you know, the shipment of weapons. I mean, you know all of this stuff. Doesn't the UN, the ICJ body at the UN, isn't that the appropriate venue for determining this question? I, I certainly would give it a lot of consideration, but I would look at other legal experts too. I mean, I don't want to prejudge a report that hasn't even come out. I do think that their report 
that did come out, which is saying that Israel needs to do far more to get aid into Gaza and needs to stop some of the bombing that's killing women and children. I agree with, and I, I and that's why I've been calling for uh, BB and the extreme right wing not to do that. But in terms of their final conclusions, let's see what the report is. I do think they need to investigate. Our State Department needs to investigate, and we'll have plenty of time for that. But that's. That's years out. Uh, what, what's immediate is how do we save lives? How do we end suffering? How do we get aid in? What is your message to those majority of previous Biden voters who do believe Israel is committing a genocide to persuade them that in spite of the fact that in their view, Joe Biden is aiding and abetting that genocide, they should still pull the lever for Joe Biden in the fall? Well, I would say first look at the alternative. I mean, Donald Trump basically uh, gave even more of a green light to Bibi Netanyahu. If anyone thinks that Bibi would be more restrained under a Donald Trump presidency, I, I think they're not looking at his Trump's four years. Kushner, uh, whose whole goal was to avoid the Palestinian issue and uh, normalize with Saudi Arabia and allow for uh, Bibi to annex more of the occupied uh, land. So uh, I would say that we have a much, much better chance of persuading President Biden uh, to call for the recognition of a Palestinian state, as I have, to call for the end of the occupation, uh, to uh, pursue a two-state solution than we would under Donald Trump. Um, what leverage do you believe that Joe Biden should use right now to secure a permanent ceasefire, not the temporary six-week thing they're floating? I think they should make it clear on the weapons transfer. That's the biggest uh, point of leverage we've had. We've had multiple weapons transfers, and we're continuing to uh, contemplate doing more weapons transfers. Uh, I would make it very clear that we're not going to continue to be the only country in the world vetoing uh, UN resolutions when it comes to uh, a, a ceasefire. Uh, those would be two very, and I just think him publicly calling for a permanent ceasefire would go uh, a, a long way. Look, uh, the Hamas position is four and a half months. Uh, Israel, we've gotten to six weeks. If Joe Biden called for a permanent ceasefire, uh, you'd probably get more pressure to get a deal done. What do you hope to see from Joe Biden in State of the Union this week, and what do you expect to hear from him? Well, I hope he will call for a permanent ceasefire with the release of all the hostages. Uh, and he can be very clear that in uh, condemning, as I have, the October 7th attacks, he can cite the UN report, which just came out about the rape and the assault of women. No one should, who's progressive, should uh, have any tolerance for that. Obviously, that has to be condemned. But then he should say, look, this war has gone on too long, too many people have suffered, too many people have died. Uh, I am calling for a permanent ceasefire with the release of all the hostages, and my team is going to work to make that happen. Uh, we're not going to be transferring weapons to uh, Israel until uh, this war uh, ends, uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, on the side of recognizing a Palestinian state and a two-state solution and calling a summit with our Gulf allies to make that happen. You hopeful that's going to be in there? I, I don't know what part of this. Uh, probably it'll be that he'll use the word ceasefire, uh, but he'll say six weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, look, the, the movement should 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 take some uh, credit and feel some sense of uh, hope that at least the word ceasefire, which used to be uh, uh, totally taboo in this town, now the president and the vice president have used that. So the, the thinking is, is changing. Uh, it's just not changing fast enough. Yeah, what is your opinion on that? Because, I mean, I'm sure you're seeing these images. I mean, the, the babies that are starving to death and just things I never wanted to see in my life, things that I never imagined we would be so directly complicit in. You see this protest movement, which has been consistent. We've seen the reports that, you know, the Biden campaign is fearful of going on college campuses because they know there'll be protests. Think about that, a Democratic president knowing how core young people are to the coalition, mm -hmm. being fearful of going on a college campus. Like, What at this point could move them when we've had tens of thousands of lives lost. You had a great exchange with uh, Secretary Austin, actually, where he admitted that he believed 25,000 women and children, women and children had been killed. And that's, you know, putting aside non-combatant males who are, you know, right. equally innocent here. So, like, what is it going to take? I think it's going to take more of us as, as part of the movement. Look, I've gone to a lot of college campuses, and uh, there are many uh, of us in Congress who have called for a permanent ceasefire. For me, it's been almost three months now since I've been calling for that with the release of all hostages. There are many of us who have said we can't just continue to transfer weapons to Israel. There are many of us who have said that we shouldn't be vetoing these UN resolutions. There are many of us, I had the head of UNRWA to talk to my colleagues and he pleaded with us, don't cut off funding. Yeah. We need food. So uh, I believe that uh, 
that I represent and other, other colleagues of mine, the future Democratic coalition of uh, young voters, of Jewish voters, many Jewish voters who care about a two-state solution and don't like BB. A of, majority of Jewish voters want a ceasefire. Yeah, of, 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 of uh, uh, progressive voters, of uh, voters of color. And there's a difference in the establishment's view of what the Democratic coalition is and what I believe the coalition is, which is actually building on Barack Obama's coalition. Mm -hmm. But if you look at 2012 in Wisconsin, two days before the election, there's a sea of young people out for Barack Obama, a sea of voters of color in Wisconsin. And that's because uh, that was the coalition. Bernie added economic justice to it. That's the coalition that came out for Biden in 2020. And that's the coalition they're risking. They have this sort of mythical view that we're going to make it up with uh, re disaffected Republicans in suburbs. Mm. And I, I just don't think that's the future Democratic coalition. So you have two very different views of what the coalition is. Now, when you take positions like mine, as you know, uh, there are consequences. You lose certain uh, uh, support from certain people in certain communities. But the question is, what's the bet on the future Democratic Party? Uh, I believe it's one that seeks uh, uh, justice uh, in the Middle East with a Palestinian state living side by side with an Israeli state and where we're not aligned with uh, people like Ben Gavir and far right wingers like Bibi. Um, last question thing I wanted to get from you, and it's very relevant to the question of the future of the Democratic Party. I'm sure you've seen APAC has announced they're going to spend some $100 million primarily against progressives in primaries who have any sort of dissenting views with regard to Israel. In fact, they've been dropping millions into this race in California against a guy who is actually very pro-Israel. Yeah, I didn't um, get that. Was, it's strange. I I, I'm not a huge fan of him just given his record, but then I was like, why is he getting targeted by uh, get, by, by by these groups? I, yeah, I, I, it's, I was perplexed. It's, I mean, it requires a level of not just, you know, total commitment to Israel and no dissenting views on the war, but also actually like direct commitment and loyalty to Bibi Netanyahu as a person, as a leader at this moment, which is just wild. And I mean, even more extreme than APAC has been in the past. But what is your reaction to that amount of money flowing into these primaries? Where is J Street? Or the you know the voices or the the um, other organizations that could be on the other side of an encouraging a new view of this conflict. How do you see this all playing out? Well, I think it's wrong to have any major super PAC money coming in on a Democratic primary. So I don't think we can unilateral, unilaterally disarm running against a Republican. Uh, you need to have uh, certain outside groups to, to be able to level the playing field. But it's wrong uh, when APEC does it. It's wrong. There's a cryptocurrency group currently that's running uh, $10 million of ads against Katie Porter. I, I mean, I've mm. endorsed Barbara Lee, but that's wrong. It would be wrong if there was some left super PAC. Uh, I don't want the answer to be that J Street should set up its own super PAC and try to compete. Well, the answer should be is get all of the big money all of the super PAC money out of Democratic primaries. Have uh, President Biden say that. Uh, have uh, Jamie Harrison say that. Have the DNC say that. So that there is a stigma to any candidate who has outside super PAC money coming in within a Democratic primary. And this way you also get past this, or you're targeting a certain point person because of their point of view. It's not that you're targeting someone because they're pro-Israel or pro-BB. Uh, you're targeting them because you don't like big money in politics. Yeah. I think that is well said. Congressman, it's great to have you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your willingness always to engage. We appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Hey, guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber, and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right. We're subscriber-funded. We're building something new. We want to replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So, again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.